Hello, and welcome to the New York State Museum's World Trade Center Rescue, Recovery, and Response. Uh, my name is Aaron Noble. I am a senior historian and curator for the museum's World Trade Center collections, and today we're going to be uh, virtually taking you on a tour uh, of the museum's uh, exhibit about September 11th and the structure of the World Trade Center. The exhibit itself uh, is designed in three parts, the first being Rescue, uh, behind me, which opened in September of 2002 on the first anniversary of the exhibit. Uh, recovery uh, will feature and includes uh, objects of recovery from the uh, FBI and NYPD operations at Fresh Kills uh, landfill on Staten Island where millions of tons of debris were brought uh, in the wake of the attacks in order to process uh, looking for criminal evidence and uh, uh, personal effects uh, for victims and survivors. And then the last uh, portion of the exhibit response documents the outpouring of uh, support and sympathy, uh, not only from across the United States, but around the world. Uh, so as we walk this way, the first object we'll see is one of the uh, recovered pieces of steel, uh, a portion of the World Trade Center columns. Uh, the, the architecture of the World Trade Center was unique in that it was uh, structurally uh, supported by the exterior walls, a, a skeleton wall, um, unlike um, more traditional skyscrapers, which have their core um, strength and, and support at the center, uh, in order to be able to build up to the 110 stories uh, of the two World Trade Center towers, uh, much of the weight had to be kind of dispersed um, in order to maximize floor space, um, but also uh, to make it light and flexible uh, in the winds uh, at that elevation. Uh, this particular uh, piece of column uh, it's about 36 feet tall. It came from the World Trade Center Tower 2 uh, and uh, gives you a sense in a, of the scope and the scale um, of these buildings. Um, this portion would have been about between one and two stories of the World Trade Center itself. Uh, the central feature of the museum's exhibit is the, World Tra is the Engine 6 uh, pumper uh, from the FDNY. Um, this vehicle uh, is one of hundreds uh, of FDNY vehicles destroyed. Uh, in the wake of the collapse of the two World Trade Center towers. Uh, this particular vehicle was chosen um, both because of the fact that Engine 6 is located within just two blocks of the World Trade Center, so its proximity to the towers, it was one of the first vehicles to respond, um, but also uh, due to the condition of the, of the truck. Um, the front, as you can see, uh, was very badly damaged and burned in the fire, um, but the back, uh, though it's crushed, um, still retains that very uh, evident and apparent um, FDNY markings and paint. Um, this is because as the World Trade Center towers collapsed, um, this particular truck was parked under a footbridge across VZ Street uh, in lower Manhattan. The footbridge fell on the back of the truck and actually worked to preserve um, the truck um, from further damage in the back. Um, because it was located two blocks from the World Trade Center towers, uh, this is one of uh, a very limited number of pumpers that were uh, purchased by the FDNY that had the ability to pump water the full 110 stories up uh, the World Trade Center. As such, it was parked at the base of one of the towers, um, pumping water, um, as we now know, ineffectively up uh, into the water standpipes in the World Trade Center, um, which had been badly damaged and destroyed in the, when the plane struck, uh, so the water was not actually reaching uh, many of the upper floors. The largest rescue really focuses on, this portion of the exhibit really focuses on the, that first 24 hours uh, from uh, sunrise on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, uh, through sunrise on September 12th. Uh, the museum at the time, in 2002, decided to uh, really focus on and use a timeline um, of the specific events of the day in order to document and, and give people a reference uh, to how uh, the day unfolded and what uh, people experienced. <clears throat> As this portion of the exhibit opened on the first anniversary, uh, selection of artifacts uh, became really critical um, and, and really challenging for, for museum staff. Um, history museums have a tendency and are, are, are used to dealing with things that happened 100, 150, 200 years ago. Um, this, in this case, we were looking at objects um, of an event of enormous importance, um, but things that were happening uh, within the last 12 months, um, let alone within our own lived experience. Um, 
one of the first pieces as visitors come into the World Trade Center gallery is a uh, portion of the armrest uh, from one of the two planes that struck the Twin Towers. This particular piece was chosen because it is immediately apparent and evident and relatable um, for anybody who has ever traveled um, by air. Um, and it really serves, we think, to create a personal connection um, to the event and to the tragedy that unfolded on the, on the two planes in New York, uh, the plane in Washington, D.C., and the one in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, as well. Um, that being said, uh, in 2002, as the mu museum was developing plans for the exhibit, it wasn't really clear that this would be an appropriate artifact. Um, it was only working closely with uh, families, and in this case, particularly um, my one of our retired curators, Craig Williams, uh, working closely with uh, the family of Jean, uh, Jean Roger, a flight attendant for United Airlines, uh, and her father, in particular, Tom. Uh, and it was only when Tom came in to view, preview the gallery uh, and saw this armrest and, and came to Craig uh, and said that this armrest made him feel closer to his daughter. Um, his daughter had been killed on one of the planes uh, and um, her body was never recovered. But having this sense of connection to his daughter through the museum artifacts uh, for the first time really confirmed to Craig and the other people working on the project here at the State Museum um, that this was a powerful piece, but this was also something that needed to be uh, exhibited and shown. Um, one of the next objects seems somewhat out of place. It's a uh, New York Post touting the Democratic primary uh, in New York City, which was on the morning of Tuesday, September 11th. <laughs> this newspaper was, was found and recovered in one of the vehicles that was taken and just was destroyed and taken to Fresh Kills. Um, but it was chosen because there were several things on the day, day of September 11th, uh, including the primary election, including the fact that it was the first day of public school in New York City. Um, these were things that many of us take for granted in the course of our daily lives, but these were things that threw people's schedules off just ever so slightly. They may have stopped at the polling place uh, to cast their ballot. Uh, they may have been delayed reporting to the office um, in order to uh, see their child off to school. But it was all of these small events that actually, in effect, um, meant that the Trade Center was actually far less occupied uh, than it had been, uh, would have normally been under other circumstances. And it was these events and these decisions that uh, people made without any kind of real thought or consequence at the time that have real dramatic ramifications for people um, as the day and the events of September 11th unfold. Much of the rest of the timeline features elements of the rescue, emergency signs from the World Trade Center, fire extinguishers that were recovered from uh, the site at Ground Zero, unidentified equipment from New York police and fire officials um, who rushed to the scene uh, and many who tragically lost their lives uh, when the buildings collapsed. Uh, in the center of the gallery aisle is a fragment of the Pentagon, which was struck by American Airlines uh, Flight 77 on the morning of September 11th um, to document, not only is this a New York event, but this is a national event and a global event. This case um, to my right uh, features relatively small objects, but things that have really enormous significance and importance. We have a fragment of glass, we have a fragment of floor marble, a bolt that held the steel together at the World Trade Center, and an elevator plaque from uh, one of the dozens of elevators at the World Trade Center. These are things that would have been used in massive quantities uh, in the construction of two 110-story structures. Um, during the recovery operation, however, very few pieces of glass, very few elevator plaques, uh, very few things that we would really associate with office life uh, were found. And that just really speaks to the, the scope and the scale of the devastation um, that was wrought when these buildings came down. As the timeline unfolds, uh, we um, begin uh, after the collapse of the towers, we, the, the exhibit focuses on, on the initial recovery efforts, the arrival of uh, reserve and off-duty fire department personnel um, in search of their comrades, in search of survivors. This jacket comes from, uh, was donated here by a member, a former member of Engine 6 um, in the truck. Uh, I'd like to take a minute here to s speak to you about the Engine 6 truck. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the truck was chosen uh, because it was both recognizable for the damage it had sustained, um, but also for the fact that it was uh, 
still clearly is an FDNY vehicle. Um, as the museum personnel were, were working at the Fresh Kills recovery operation and working at Ground Zero, uh, they worked closely uh, with personnel and leadership from the FDNY um, in order to identify uh, an appropriate vehicle to be preserved and brought to Albany um, as part of this exhibit project. Um, but it wasn't just that they were able to obtain permission from leadership at the FDNY. Um, it was very important for curators here at the museum to uh, engage with and get the approval and the, and the buy-in from uh, families of the four firefighters that were tragically lost uh, from Engine Company 6 on uh, September 11th, but also the surviving members of, of the Engine Company. Um, the truck was transported from Ground Zero to Fresh Kills on Staten Island, where it was uh, marked and investigated by FDNY and NYPD and FBI uh, personnel. Um, it was flagged by uh, the museum. Uh, and here, uh, being a state agency, the museum was re really in a unique situ position uh, because we are a state agency. We were able to, to really call upon the breadth of uh, state government to assist in acquiring an object of the size and scope of Engine 6. Uh, the truck itself was transported from Staten Island uh, to Mid-Orange correctional facility um, by the New York National Guard, the 369th Sustainment Battalion. Um, once at Mid-Orange Correctional Facility, um, this is a New York State uh, prison uh, where prisoners are uh, trained and educated in um, asbestos abatement and toxic um, material and hazardous material removal. Prisoners and, and personnel at, at Mid-Orange uh, constructed a, a tent around uh, Engine 6 uh, and spent the next several weeks um, meticulously cleaning it of uh, the toxic chemicals that had coated it um, once those two buildings collapsed. Once the cleaning was done, uh, the men of Engine 6 and the families um, of the lost firefighters were invited to come up to the facility. Uh, and if you look at the hose on the back, it is um, remarkably organized and neat, and this is because it was relayed by the men of Engine 6, by the uh, comrades of those four firefighters who had lost their lives um, in, a, in the in traditional pattern, um, as if the truck is ready for its next run. Um, on the wall next to the truck is a facsimile copy of uh, the riding list uh, from September 10th, 2001, um, detailing the uh, the men who responded on Engine 6, uh, Lieutenant O'Hagan, uh, firefighters Jack Butler, Paul Bayer, Billy Green, and uh, William Johnston. This piece highlights some of the, the, the challenges of working with uh, materials from the World Trade Center. Uh, the piece is a chalkboard. The artifact is itself a chalkboard. It was never intended to be a permanent object. How do you preserve it? How do you uh, present it to the public? Um, so in, in the gallery, we have a facsimile, the original remains in the museum collection uh, in secure storage, um, still preserved to this very day. Um, but on the list, again, seeing how uh, just the matter, uh, just a, a difference of a few minutes um, would have devastating consequences uh, for many individuals. Uh, the men who responded uh, from Engine 6 were on the six by nine shift which means that their, that their shift began at 6 p.m. on uh, September 10th um, and would have ended at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning on uh, the morning of September 11th. The first plane uh, strikes uh, the World Trade Center complex uh, at 8.46 a.m. In that, in that span of 14 minutes, you would have had a completely different group of, of firefighters responding to the event. Um, and I bring this up because this has, uh, has had tremendous impact and, and tremendous um, meaning for the men uh, of Engine 6 and other firefighters uh, who um, still bear, uh, in many cases, uh, survivor's guilt and, and um, still struggle with the fact that in their uh, minds it should have been them to have been present and to have responded um, at the World Trade Center. Uh, at the turning point of the gallery, um, we have another steel column. Um, this one, unlike the first one that we encounter uh, as we walk into the gallery, um, clearly demonstrates uh, visually uh, 
the force and the absolute trauma that these buildings sustained uh, during the collapse. Uh, this piece of steel uh, came from the 71st to 79th floor uh, of World Trade Center Tower 1. Um, it was recovered, still bearing the, initial, the uh, original markings uh, from when the tower was constructed in the 1970s. Uh, but for a piece of steel of that magnitude to have been bent um, as if it was uh, a piece of paper folded in half really clearly demonstrates the force and the, and the, the power of the tr collapse of the Twin Towers. As we start on the recovery wall, uh, the first object again highlights the importance of working and uh, engaging with uh, the people who are actually conducting the recovery operations that were working on the ground. On the wall on this panel here is a small marble that was carried by F uh, FBI agent Richard Marks um, who is in command of the Fresh Kills recovery operation. This marble was recovered very early on in the process. Um, Agent Marks kept the, the marble in his pocket so that he could show families who came to uh, Fresh Kills in Staten Island uh, for periodic updates um, on whether or not anything of their loved ones had been recovered, to be able to show them to the, the degree to which um, these millions of tons of material were being sifted and sorted uh, in the hopes of finding uh, evidence of their lost loved ones. Uh, the cases along the recovery wall, uh, again, feature um, artifacts and objects that speak to the life of the World Trade Center as a large and massive and, and incredibly lively and busy office complex. Um, keys, uh, all bearing the stamp World Trade Center, more elevator plaques, security patches, um, other objects, uh, for our younger visitors are, are a little bit less well known. We have one of two payphones uh, that were recovered at the World Trade Center site um, on exhibit here. Um, we have a stack of floppy disks uh, in the case next to me um, that were fused together in the heat of the fires at the World Trade Center site. Uh, we have objects and materials that were sold in the gift shop uh, at the observation deck of uh, One World Trade Center. Also in this case here we have a uh, fragment of a handpiece of a telephone. Again, one of the most ubiquitous things, that, uh, objects that would be found in any kind of modern office. Um, and to have uh, so few of those recovered really speaks to the fact that the, the loss at the World Trade Center at Ground Zero was really total. Um, photographs um, taken by museum staff showing uh, the recovery operation and the sorting uh, operations. Um, and then objects that were recovered from several of the vehicles um, at the World Trade Center site. One of the lesser known aspects of the, of the World Trade Center complex, because it was a government run organization or facility, um, building number six at the complex um, housed the evidence repositories for many of the federal agencies in New York. Um, so these firearms here, um, oftentimes visitors mistakenly think that they were either law enforcement or that they were used by uh, the terrorists um, on the airplanes. But in fact, these were uh, weapons um, that were recovered in various criminal investigations uh, that were destroyed. Um, the destruction of the World Trade Center complex led to uh, numerous instances of, of evidence loss in, in criminal investigations. This platform uh, to my right um, bears a lot of the materials and, and, and features uh, of the uh, plaza level of the World Trade Center, um, things that would have been seen uh, at street level. Uh, these iron or steel bollards that had been installed after the att attempted bombing in 1993 uh, to prevent large vehicles from driving onto the plaza unimpeded. Uh, a light post recovered uh, and brought to uh, JFK Airport Hangar 17 um, and preserved uh, and then eventually brought here to Albany. Fire hydrants and lamp posts um, from around the World Trade Center site. Here we have uh, several larger pieces of uh, aircraft. When these two Boeing 767s uh, struck uh, the World Trade Center, the debris was scattered across lower Manhattan. Um, given the size and scope of the planes, however, very few pieces were recovered. Um, initially, curators were hesitant to preserve or save um, 
pieces of the planes because there was a real concern amongst uh, museum staff, not only at the State Museum here, but at other museums down in New York City, um, that the presence and the visibility of, of these plane pieces would be too visceral and too upsetting um, to our museum visitors uh, and to staff at the time who were, were experiencing and trying to make these decisions really in, uh, as history was unfolding. Uh, it was actually a member of one of the uh, Airlines, uh, a mechanic who was at Fresh Kills assisting with evidence recovery and ident identification of plane fragments, who pulled one of our curators aside and pled with him uh, to, to change the museum's decision um, and to actually preserve and keep um, pieces of the planes. Um, he recognized better than uh, many of the museum that uh, whatever the museum didn't take would have been uh, buried um, at uh, Staten Island at Fresh Kills uh, and would never be available again. And he pled and, and, and convinced museum staff uh, of the need to preserve this history and this part of the story and to keep objects to do so. Um, ultimately, the museum preserved uh, 48 pieces of the two aircraft. Um, none of them uh, can be identified to a particular plane, um, but we know that both um, planes are most likely represented. This piece of steel is also included here. Uh, and I'll step back so that we can uh, really focus in on uh, this end uh, piece here. This is a, a fragment of uh, the aluminum honeycomb uh, from an aircraft fuselage um, that has been fused because of the heat of the fire um, to one of the building's uh, steel structural components. Um, again, highlighting just the immense trauma of, of the events of that day. So as the gallery was being designed and as it was being kind of laid out, uh, the hope was that the final section response would allow visitors to uh, kind of give them a moment to kind of collect their thoughts, to, uh, to compose themselves, and to also be able to leave um, with a little bit more of an uplifting uh, and positive and, and reassuring note. Um, currently on display behind me is a, a church pew uh, that was donated here from St. Paul's uh, Chapel, uh, a historic church located just 400 yards uh, from the uh, original World Trade Center. Uh, following the collapse of the buildings, there was tremendous destruction and in, in, in all around uh, the complex. Uh, somehow, St. Paul's survived almost completely unscathed. Um, because it was so close to the, tra the Trade Center, uh, it obviously could not open for uh, and resume uh, normal operations uh, in the immediate aftermath. Uh, the congregation and the pastors at St. Paul's made the decision uh, to open their doors uh, to the recovery workers uh, and rescue personnel um, in order to give them a sanctuary away from the noise and the, uh, just the site of Ground Zero. Uh, eventually hundreds and uh, probably at the, by the end of it, thousands of individuals came and volunteered at St. Paul's, providing everything from hot meals to counseling to um, chiropractic and uh, massage therapy um, in order to uh, alleviate the suffering and, and, and the, the wear on uh, these men and women who were day in and day out uh, at the site doing recovery operations. Several years ago, the, the church underwent a, a series of renovations in order to modernize and to update uh, its interior. During that process, it was decided that they didn't want to destroy the history that was really etched into these pews. Um, you can see the scratches, um, the scuffs, and the markings on this, uh, this pew here. Those were caused by the tool belts uh, and the equipment of recovery workers as they sat down to take uh, a moment to rest. Um, and so this uh, object is really marked with, uh, with the history of that recovery effort and, and the efforts that were going on at St. Paul's. Uh, so they removed all the pews. They contacted uh, the New York State Museum and other uh, historical uh, repositories in order to make sure that that part of the story could be preserved. And the last thing I want to talk about is, is one of our rotating components in the gallery uh, featuring uh, survivors of the World Trade Center uh, and survivors of September 11th. Uh, there's a lot to focus on about the fact that nearly 3,000 
men and women lost their lives uh, in the attacks of September 11th. Um, but it's also important to remember that uh, between 30 and 50,000 people were successfully evacuated um, in just 102 minutes uh, from seven buildings at the World Trade Center site, making it one of the largest and most successful rescue operations ever uh, undertaken. Uh, we have objects related to uh, some of the survivors and, and we've highlighted uh, three personal stories um, to attest to the survivors uh, of the World Trade Center and, uh, and that part of the story. So as we conclude, people may not realize that the New York State Museum is one of the largest repositories for, for material from the state uh, from September 11th. Um, this comes from the fact that as a, the State Museum, we are the official repository um, of anything of historic value or interest um, that happens in the state of New York, and, and particularly with state government. Um, when the Twin Towers collapsed, uh, it triggered a relatively unknown clause within New York State Education Law, um, Section 233. Um, which actually makes, um, because the Port Authority itself was managed by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, a joint state um, governmental agency, um, the building and the materials that were found there became, we, we, we kind of became the, the official repository and, and the government sanctioned repository for these materials. Um, we worked closely with the Port Authority. Uh, we've also worked closely with museums in New York City and with uh, the organizi organizing bodies um, that created the museum that is currently at uh, the National September 11th Memorial and Museum at Ground Zero. Um, one of the things that you may, not, you may not have seen and you may have questions about is the fact that there aren't a lot of personal effects outside of the, uh, the materials in the survivor case. Um, and this is because, and this is one of the challenges that occurred in attempting to collect in real time uh, Every effort was being made by the FDNY and the NYPD, rightfully so, uh, to return anything that could be identified to an individual, uh, to their families, or to, uh, in the hopes that those individuals survived to the, the survivors. One of the th challenges with this, with, that, with the State Museum's exhibit, is that we, uh, we do lack some of the faces of 9-11 that really make it compelling, uh, and we're constantly working to, uh, to update and to uh, to, to improve the way that this exhibit is interpreted um, and to add new things to our collections. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this short tour of the museum's World Trade Center exhibit.